Good afternoon and welcome to this I-24 News special edition. Today, the four French Jews who were killed in last week's terror attack on a kosher supermarket in Paris will be buried at the Givat Shoul Cemetery in Jerusalem. The bodies of the victims, Yohan Cohen, 22, Yoav Khatab, 21, Philippe Baram, 45, and Francois Michel Saada, 64, arrived early this morning at Ben Gurion Airport. They were killed last Friday when Amadi Koulibaly stormed the Hyper Kasher store and opened fire. This followed an attack earlier in the week on the head office of the Charlie Hebdo satirical magazine, which left 12 people dead. In the aftermath of three-day ordeal, an outpouring of support has come from all corners of the globe, embodied by the widespread adoption of the slogan, Je suis Charlie. On Sunday, a mass rally was held in Paris, attended by more than one million people and 40 world leaders. Joining me now in the studio are Colette Vital, a former Israeli deputy ambassador to France. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Yossi Frankel, a volunteer uh, of Zaka. Uh, the, the funeral actually began. We're going to go to, to some live images uh, from the scene uh, at the moment. Um, live image, there we are, where uh, the funerals will begin shortly. Of course, we're going to receive live updates from uh, our volunteers. We see. Uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, we know President Reuven Rivlin, we also see the head of the opposition, Isaac Herzog, all attending uh, the funeral. <coughs> now, uh, before we begin with our guests in the studio, we'd like to have a short recap of this past week's horrific uh, terror attack in Paris. Les trois hommes euh, en armes qui ont investi les locaux de Charlie Hebdo, Kalashnikov, fusée à pompe. Et nous avons donc euh, engagé le plan Vigie Pirate Attentat. Il y a 12 personnes disparues, 8 blessées, dont 4 euh, en situation d'urgence euh, absolue. Témoins, les tireurs criaient « Allah Akbar » et affirmaient vouloir venger le prophète. Quel prophète Leur prophète, c'est Satan, malheureusement. Un policier, en toute occasion, saura s'interposer lorsqu'il faudra qu'il protège la nation. Actuellement, une opération est en cours. Un individu de type africain, euh, porteur d'une Kalachnikov, a été signalé présent là à hauteur du 23 avenue de la Porte de Vincennes. Et d'après la gérante qui est à l'intérieur et de sources policières, euh, il y avait des morts. Dans le moment où nous sommes, nous devons tout faire pour assurer la protection de nos concitoyens. On sera capable aussi de résister à toutes les épreuves. Thank you uh, once again for joining me, Ambassador Vital and uh, Mr. Frankel. Before we begin, we're going to get a quick update from our diplomatic correspondent, correspondent Tal Shalev, who is in Jerusalem, uh, right outside the funeral. Tal, what can you tell us from there? Well, uh, good afternoon, Michal. Thousands of people have gathered here at the uh, Haram Nuchot Cemetery in Jerusalem, and the uh, uh, ceremony is expected to start shortly. Everyone is paying their final respect to the four victims of the hyper attack on Friday in Paris, and uh, um, the coffins of uh, the four victims, uh, Yoram Khatav, Yohan Cohen, Philippe Bram, and uh, Francois Michel uh, Salame, have, uh, uh, Saada, excuse me, ha uh, arrived early this morning. Uh, Seems like we've been uh, cut off, so we shall begin, and we'll be back uh, later with live coverage from the funeral. 
Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start with you, Ambassador Vital. Um, the families decided to bury the victims in Israel while they still live in France. Some of them might make Aliyah, but at the moment they're all living in France. Could this possibly be because of their anger towards the French government? I don't think so. I think that probably it is it denotes also of their attachment to Israel, to what Israel represents, to what this land represents. But I really like to use this opportunity to present my condolences. I'm sure everybody feels like me to the families, and I do know that one of the uh, victims of the attack is the father of one of the producers here yes. at this station. So from all our heart, I think we all this is a sad moment for all of us. Indeed. Thank you. It is a very sad moment also for all of us at I-24 News. Um, Mr. Frankel, uh, which brings me, me to you, Zaka. I think you probably have one of the most difficult jobs in the world. You're the first to arrive at most crisis uh, scenes to give the immediate response. What can you tell us a little bit about the procedures and about Zaka, what you stand for? Zaka was founded in 1979 when a terrorist boarded the 405 bus which travels across, uh, across Kvish uh, where the terrorist actually approached the driver, pulled a stone wheel to the right, which rolled the bus over the ravine, killing 17 people instantly. Since its inauguration, we've been, we've branched out into many different uh, divisions, whether it's from rescue to standard life-saving. We first responders under Magen David Adom, um, we run by the slogan of saving those who can be saved and honoring those who can't. Are uh, special measures taken for victims of terror? For sure. Special measures are taken in when everybody runs away from a terrorist scene, we're the ones actually running into it. Um, it's not an easy thing for us. It's one of the hardest things. And what gives me more courage is actually seeing our fellow members, you know, standing side by side to support each other. Um, Before I talk about the the victims, I, I do mm -hmm. want to talk more about the volunteers. It, it must take a psychological toll. And, and what I'm wondering, uh, you are a volunteer. How do volunteers deal with the, the psychological standpoint based on this line of work? We, I'll, I'll put it like this. When we go out and save a life, I know that person can turn around and thank us. But if I'm getting that call for a dead person, I know if that dead person is going to turn around and thank me, I'm going to run the other way. The only way that we actually um, support ourselves and, and deal with the uh, crisis is once we deal with a major disaster, uh, for instance, the Harnoff uh, shooting, two days after the, the uh, terrorist attack, we had a divuv, we had a, a, a briefing where we actually sit down with um, trained professionals, psychologists, to debrief us on the situation, which helps us. But the most important thing to know is that Every member supports each other. We are one family. Now, for our viewers and, and for all of us to understand maybe and have a little insight into your work, can you tell us about the procedure from Paris until the moment the bodies arrived, the victims' bodies arrived here in uh, Jerusalem? If you can take us through just a little bit. Sure. Um, Friday afternoon, we heard of the, uh, uh, we've initially heard of the terrorist attack. At which point, my counterpart uh, Matty Goldstein, who happens to be the uh, the head of the Zaka International teams, um, was dealing with finding out how many members there were, how many uh, sorry, how many victims there were, um, dealing with the foreign ministry, dealing with uh, the, our members on the scene. Zaka actually have 26 different countries uh, where we have teams. France is one of them, and our members were on the scene pretty much right away, and they were uh, relaying back to us, whether it be myself or my counterpart, uh, uh, Mati, uh, regarding the incident and regarding what's going on. Um, after Shabbat, we had a, another briefing with Rabbi Yehuda Meshizav, who's the chairman, um, otherwise known as the angel, behind Zaka. Incredible person, really. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and. Uh, it was decided on uh, Sunday we will get the flight at the uh, 5.30 flight uh, Lal, um, to Paris, which would get us there about 9 o'clock in the evening, 9.30. My guys were already, um, my Israeli team was already on the scene at the uh, Hippokosha uh, supermarket. Once they got in, they did the holy task of uh, collecting the, the remains. Now, something that you should know, being over here in Israel, we don't see this. But 
when my members walked in to the hippo kosher, people were just astounded from people from all walks of life, whether religious or whether not, those who don't even know anything about religion, were there to support their Jewish brethren. And the most amazing thing that actually happened there was they all supported our members who were going in there to do the holy work, unknown to what they're going into, how bad the scenes are. We're going in with the support from the public. We're going in with the support from our communities. And that alone helps us to get through it. Once we finished uh, with the cleanup, the bodies, uh, we, we, our teams went then to the equivalent of Abu Kabir, the uh, forensics uh, department there, to deal with the um, cleanup, so to say, over there, to prepare the bodies for um, transport to Israel to be buried. In fact, to note, my teams are still there, still dealing with the cleanup. Okay, and uh, we're actually going to go to some live footage now from uh, France. I think we have a feed. Here we are. Um, we can see a memorial ceremony that is also taking place at the moment. Uh, Ambassador Vital, um, if we stick uh, still with the, the experience of uh, the victims, and we can see, sorry, a moment of silence here uh, taking place in uh, France. Uh, Ambassador Vital, the, the victims are experiencing this grief and, and their funeral, which is something very personal, has become something of a national scale, something maybe politicized. Do you think, in a way, it's coming at the expense of the bereaved families, this large national scale uh, ceremony? <clears throat> no, I think that, um, first of all, I have to say that I am moved. I'm moved by everything that I see, and I'm moved that the scene that we see now at soldiers standing uh, uh, on guard for the funeral. Uh, and I think that it must be a comfort for the family. Obviously, you know, many scenes have passed through my head. During the second intifada, many of us would go out in the morning, uh, go to a supermarket or go uh, to a restaurant, and we never knew if we would come out alive. And I remember that on a daily basis. And I remember so many of my friends and, and people that I knew well getting killed. And, and you cannot help but think of those people who went on a Friday innocently in a supermarket, not even fancying or dreaming that this would happen to them or to their and their families couldn't realize it. And I think that the fact that there's so much public support and, and you see both what has been happening in France to pay them tribute and in Israel. I think this must be a comfort to the family. Obviously, there's nothing that can really be a consolation to somebody who's lost her father or her husband or who's remained alone with children and doesn't know what to do next. But I think that the way to pay tribute to those people is something of great importance. And I really and truly do not wish to mix any politics in it. I think we are doing the right thing by bringing them to funeral here. The French government has done the right thing. Um, let us just keep their memory alive. Definitely. It's uh, important to remember that it is a very emotional day, and it shouldn't be made political. Um, however, you did spend time in France, and you're familiar with the culture and with the people, and you speak French. Did you ever imagine that the situation, especially for French Jews, could deteriorate this much? French Jews are, are running away. They're seeing Aliyah as a necessity. Yes, well, you know, I would prefer to see Aliyah not as a necessity, but an act of, of faith and Zionism, and not only running away from something. And I'm not sure that this is the right way to encourage them to run away. By the way, by encouraging people to run away, it's also, in a way, conceding to terrorism and telling the jihadis that they have won in this particular case. But I would like to say something, you know, when I was in France, I was there in the 80s, and that was during the Lebanon War. And there was hardly a day without an incident, without an act of terrorism. Many of those were uh, um, addressed or, or aimed, targeted at Israeli uh, diplomats and so 
Lebanon. I was there when some of my colleagues got killed. I, one of my colleagues at the embassy, I saw him on a Saturday morning when I went to pick up my mail and my newspapers, and five minutes later he was assassinated. That was a very tough time, and, and there was also uh, um, an incident at, uh, at one of the restaurants, the Goldberg restaurant. So it's not that it's getting worse. It is the anti-Semitism has been growing, but it has been changing its face. And I think it is important for us to understand two things. First thing is that most of anti-Semitic acts today in Europe and elsewhere, 80% are carried not by the Catholic, French people, but by the Muslims. And this is a new phenomenon, and unfortunately, Every time that there are incidents or wars in the Middle East, this becomes worse. And the second thing I think to remember is the fact that we're not the only targets in this particular case. Absolutely. What is being what targeted? Yeah, what is being targeted <clears throat> is Western civilization. And we are one of the targets. That again doesn't make it any better for us. But I think it is important to see the general context, to see that it is again, targeted also against governments at that yeah, I'd like to talk more about yeah. the, the nature, uh, whether it's anti-Semitic or really uh, an attack on people. But we have, uh, we're going um, to uh, a phone call we have with Paris, uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Hefetz, who is the Israeli emissary of the Jewish agency, joining me now on the phone. Hi, Jonathan. Hello again. Hi, thanks for joining us. What's the latest? I know that... Uh, the, the last time you spoke with us, you said that the Jewish community is in, in entire shock. Uh, of course, you're there um, supporting Aliyah, but uh, what can you tell us about these past few days and your activities and the community and how they're dealing with the situation? Um, as a director of the Shomer Seir movement, uh, which is the youth movement in the community, uh, we spoke with our we spoke with our counselors, spoke with our uh, younger kids about uh, the situation. Uh, we didn't have an activity last uh, Saturday uh, due to uh, security reasons, but we still had an activity with our counselors. Uh, it's a uh, it's hard, hard atmosphere, um, especially today. With um, especially today, um, we're all a bit uh, sad and uh, thinking about uh, those who have died in the past events. Uh, but with uh, with all of that. And the fact that uh, the Jewish agency is supporting Aliyah, um, we're also thinking about what's next. What's what's the future for the Jewish community here in Paris? Which and, is also uh, very raise, important. And, and what, can, what can you of, tell uh, us? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Continue. And, uh, with the race. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jonathan. Um, what can you tell us about dealing with the French community that does want to stay in France, that feels connected to Israel, but sees their life? in Paris, in France, as a French Jew, which should also be possible for those who want to stay in their homeland. So yesterday we had actually a meeting with uh, most of the youth movement uh, here, in, uh, here in Paris. Uh, and after uh, 30 minutes of talking about security, we started talking about what's next. And uh, I think that the first thing that came uh, to everybody's mind, and I was sure that I was the one who's going to propose is someone who's coming from Israel, um, we talked about dialogue. We talked about uh, how how we're going to reach now the Muslim uh, community. And I think um, there's a French philosopher, Bernard Henri Lévy, who spoke about uh, the fear of uh, Islamophobia and uh, the fact that he doesn't want to see the French nation and the Jewish community <coughs> uh, going against the Muslim uh, community right now uh, here in France. Um, but I think that the main the main thing is that. There are a lot of people who are saying we're here to stay, we're here to fight uh, our lives, and uh, we won't we won't be afraid and frightened by terror, and we will stand our guards uh, in front of uh, the Islamic terror, the radical Islamic terror, uh, who came to our front door. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan Hefetz from Paris. Now. Uh Mr. Franke, we're, we're going back to you. Uh, we're going to show some live footage from the funeral. Can you explain to us, maybe a little bit from a, a ritual standpoint, what we're seeing uh, taking place at the funeral and what we can expect? Well, the 
the services that uh, uh, that we're seeing at the moment right now, um, if I'm not mistaken, is the uh, the uh, mayor of Jerusalem. No. The, the sure. mayor of Jerusalem. Yeah, the mayor of Jerusalem, together with um, one of uh, the one of the I think the family, family members, members of yeah. um, of the uh, terrorist attack. Now, the way we would work at at the funeral is the bodies are brought out as oh, wow. the, as we saw earlier. My uh, our proud members. Um, four uh, per body, bringing them out to the stage uh, or to the platform, I should say. Um, followed by Kaddish, uh, we would also have, uh, and because of the intensity of this specific funeral, we have different dignitaries speaking as well, giving their eulogies. But then we would also have the Kail Malay Khamim, which is the uh, um, the mourners' uh, uh, prayer, so to say. And then we will actually take the bodies to uh, mm, bury them into uh, mm. in the ground. And the reason why we do that is because of one of the things that the Torah says, which is when the, per the same way a person is brought into the world, so too shall they return. And because we we originally made from fire, water, and dust, so we return to the ground, um, which is, is what we are that going to see throughout the. Uh, what you see now is the uh, widow of one of the victims mm -hmm. of the situation. And, and maybe we can hear some of the the funeral. Are we going to go live? Yeah, we're going to go live so we can hear some of uh, mm -hmm. the eulogizing. I am Ben Adam. Was a person. Perfect. Was a perfect man. How did you say? A person that thought first about others before he thought of himself. An excellent husband and the father who loved his kids and lived only for them. Today, Together with my son, I cry, but I know that you all cry with me, and I thank all of you for all of this. I wouldn't believe all of this. That was uh, the wife of uh, the widow of Philippe Baram. A very emotional day. Uh, their life changed in an instance, and it's a, it's a difficult time uh, to to think about tomorrow. Everyone is still in a state of shock. The Jewish community are in a state of, of shock in France and in hysteria. Uh, but uh, the former we had, Jonathan Chefet, spoke about interfaith dialogue, which actually now is a time. And and I wonder if this is so. I know that uh, the current Israeli ambassador to uh, to France in Paris, Yossi Gal, hosted an interfaith dialogue uh, group of Muslim and Jewish leaders this past uh, these past few months. Are Jewish and Muslim uh, relations doomed in France, or maybe this is a time to actually promote such initiatives? What do I you think, think uh, that the relations are not doomed, uh, but I think that <clears throat> if we're speaking of relations that are doomed, let's not forget that there are also very difficult relations between moderate Muslims and the jihadists, that many of the moderate Muslims also feel powerless, also feel in a way um, victims, and, and some of them indeed have been killed uh, in France and elsewhere. Absolutely, but so could I modern would Islam lift its head up above that the is, Could that this is, be their moment? That is the very question, and I'm not sure that this is the case, because by, by definition, when you're moderate, you don't speak up, you don't speak loud, uh, and it's, it's very difficult. I think that what we're seeing here is a trend in Islam, which has developed over the years, 
and that they have today a strategy which is called the Quran concept of war, which was written in a book by a Pakistani by the name of General Malik in the 70s and espoused by many of these groups. It's not new. There have been extremist Salafis. But what we're seeing today is really almost a political a strategy, a political theory, in a way like Nazism was at the time. So I think it takes more than interfaith dialogue with the moderates. Uh, it's very nice, but I don't think it will help very much. Maybe it will help in the long run through education. What I think is one has to figure out what one has to do, what kind of resolve one has to take in order to combat this kind of a scourge, which in many ways is malignant. What we're talking about is something which is malignant and which has taken over also some of the Arab world, let us not forget it. And perhaps the burning question in Europe would be, is Europe and is France prepared and able to tackle extreme Islamism? I think France is, but I think that France alone cannot do it. And again, the difference is that today in those countries, many of the people who carry out these acts of terrorism are French citizens or uh, um, German citizens or Norwegian citizens and so on. So I think it takes much, much more than that. It's not only France. It is. It has to be an international cooperation of polices and of intelligence and of putting on, on the table different means of combating this. And, and basically, we, I think, you know, it's a big word to say, but this is a war of civilizations. Now, what you're saying is that there should be a collective reaction, a global fight, which I guess there is. And there's going there to is be. Already. And there's going to be. But the question is, in Europe, um, could this lead to um, the rise of the other extremism, of sure. Islamophobia, of, of right wing? How? I, I, we, yesterday, last evening in, in Germany, there was an anti-Islam rally. At the end of the day, the, the immigrants in France don't want immigration laws to change, they would be the, the first victims of this. And the question is, how do you deal with extreme Islam without you know, going to the other extreme of fascism and, and completely well, taking away people's I uh, think in many rights. ways, uh, the same way we're talking about it in Israel, and excuse me for saying this and making a parallel, we have to combat extre extremisms on both sides. But basically, I think maybe what is important to understand is that it's not just uh, extremism that will come up and it will come up. It, probably what we will see as a political phenomenon is the rise of fascist and of uh, extreme right-wing political parties. Already in France, you see Marine Le Pen. The next election is 2017. You, you may, probably you will see, I'm not, I, I really don't want to be a prophet here, but you see already the rise of Marine Le Pen to what level she has come. You see that in Belgium and you see that in Denmark and you see that in Germany and so on. So basically the question is also at this level, a political question, how will moderate political parties and left-wing political parties combat this kind of fascism? Absolutely. Um, well, hopefully, moderate Islam will take a, a stronger stance. But uh, again, we, we will have to wait and see. And this is not the first time the Jewish community is being targeted. Um, no major changes were made. Do you think past... Oh, yes. Major changes have been made. If you have today 5,000 soldiers uh, no, protecting... No, now major yeah. changes are made. Yeah. But until now, governments didn't Not enough. act enough. Not enough. Not and the enough. question is, can France uh, deal with this new reality? As you said, 5,000 soldiers deployed. 10,000 have been deployed. 5,000 just for uh, uh, Jewish institutions. Is this the new reality for France? Unfortunately, it is. The question is how long it will last. The question is how long the French will carry on this kind of vigilance. And the question is, if I was a Jewish kid, would I like to live like that? If I was a Jewish parent, would I like my children to be all the time surrounded by policemen? So it's not a normal situation. I think it's a good thing <clears throat> that <clears throat> Jewish targets are being protected. But I think in the long range, uh, 
combating terrorism and, and undoing terrorist cells is as important as what we see as protection today. And, and what about society and the societal divide that's already uh, apparent? Uh, a lot of attacks on, uh, on Muslims these past few days as a result. What should the French government do? How are they supposed to react? There's been a divide. Things uh, have deteriorated. And, and there are com entire neighborhoods where, where the police force is even afraid to enter. How do they tackle this? Oh, we're going to go live before we answer that question. Uh, President Riven speaking at the funeral. Please. Minister of Environment and Energy of France, this is Ségolène Royal, the first of Zion, Rabbi Yitzhak Yosef, the first Rabbi of Israel, David Lau, ministers, members of Knesset, dear ambassadors, distinguished guests, Family, the families, Khatab, Kohen, the loved families, ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, Johan, Philippe, Francois, Michel. This is not the way we wanted to receive you in Israel. This is not the way we wanted you to come to the to Eretz Israel. We wanted to see you come back home to the state of Israel, to its capital, Jerusalem. We asked for you alive. We asked for you alive. In these very moments, I stand in front of you with a broken heart, hurting, and with me stands crying an entire nation. Philippe, you wanted, we were told, to do shopping for Shabbat. And what's more Jewish than shopping for, on a Friday, for the Holy Shabbat? My father, the hero, your son is crying now. He was murdered only because he was Jewish. This is what he says. What can we tell your wife, Philippe? What can we tell your three young children who will cry out, Father, and their cry will remain orphan? Francois Michel, the apartment you bought here in Israel is ready for you. You wanted so much to do Aliyah, to live here with us. But you're not going to place a mezuzah in your new apartment. It was said, who is the man who would build a new home and will not go into it, will go back to his home unless he, unless he dies in a war. This is the word of the Torah. And now war has come to you. The hand of the assassin finished it all. Yoav, two weeks ago you were here, here in Jerusalem. For the very first time, you visited the, Kot, the Wailing Wall. You took a picture of you with the flag surrounding you. Now you come here for the second time. And, oh God, the last time, your return as a Jewish hero is one of us. Johan, you could have uh, run away, but no, you didn't give up. You struggled against the murder in order to save the life of a young child, three-year-old. You succeeded in your struggle, but you paid for it with your life. Only 20 and already a hero, a soldier of the Jewish people, dear families, the entire home of Israel, Philippe Baram, Yoav Khatab, Yohan Cohen and Francia Michel Sada were assassinated on a Shabbat evening in a kosher hyper-kasher in cold blood because they were Jewish. 
the assassin made sure that it is a Jewish place and only later did he assassin the people. This is pure evil, terrifying. It wakes memories, terrible memories. This is a hating of Jews. It's deep, it's dark. It pierces, it tries to strike us wherever we are, wherever we have Jewish lives, in Paris and in Jerusalem, in Toulouse and in Tel Aviv, in Brussels and in Mumbai, in the streets and in the synagogues, in schools and in the neighborhood grocery store, in the train station and in the museum. Like many others, I watched the millions marching in the streets of France together with you, your Prime Minister. It was a show of sympathy that warmed the heart. The past weeks and months proved that terrorism does not differentiate blood from blood. Still, we cannot ignore that this terror chases the people of the Jewish people, whereas of Tzitzit, whereas of Yamakas, those who eat kosher, who pray in synagogues, and babies from the house of Rabban. It is dangerous, it is dangerous to forget that this is anti-Semitism, whether it is old anti-Semitism or new anti-Semitism. It doesn't make a difference what are the twisted motives of the terrorists. The leaders of Europe, Madame Minister, must act actively and take a strong hand to regain the sense of uh, security of the Jews of Europe in Toulouse, Bourgas, and so on. It is impossible that in 2015, 70 years after the end of the Second World War, Jews are afraid to walk with a yarmulke on their heads and that is it in their clothing in Europe. It's impossible that every other day we hear of distortion of Jewish uh, cemeteries, of communities under attack. It is impossible to ignore anymore. We cannot be forgiveful, we, we cannot be forgiving against wild anti-Semitism. Violence and ignorance will not disappear on their own. My brothers, members of the Jewish community in France, in the last few years, the connection between the Jewish community in France and the State of Israel is, being, is becoming stronger. Its citizens, the citizens of Israel and the people, this connection comes is in happy days and terrible uh, events. Here we stood together here and joined for eternal rest. Miriam Onsengo and the Rabbi Yonatan Sendler and his dear children, Gabriel and Narie. Only in the last summer, the nation of Israel stood as one person and in the funeral of Jordan Simon, a lone soldier born in France. I met Yamin and Josiane, the parents of Jordan, and Lorraine and Karen, his sisters, when they were sitting in a shiva in the city of Ashkelon. I met special people, families filled with love of Israel, with love of Jewish tradition, and love of the state of Israel. In these sad moments, I learned how we are really one people, how much, how important it is for us to remain together, close to each other, despite the distance. Today, we are brothers, members of the same family, a people that bows, cries out, tears. This is the connection that the days and borders cannot uh, surpass. It is a connection of blood and of spirit.
A lot was said since the murder of the Aliyah of the Jews of France. My dear brothers, citizens of France, Jewish citizens of France, you are very welcome. Our country is your country. Our home is your home. Our arms are open and our eyes are waiting to see you come back to Israel. But coming back to Israel should not be under a crisis, under these terrifying moments. Terrorism cannot win and it never won over us and we don't want terrorism to win over you. The land of Israel is the land of choice. We want you to choose to come here from love. Dear families, above your, the graves of your loved ones, you have Johan, Francois, Michel and Philippe. We promise you, we will continue to struggle for your right to live as Jews wherever you are. We'll continue to struggle for your right to open and to light up your synagogues, to educate children with the Torah of the love of Israel and of the correction of the world. Jewish blood cannot be spilled unpunished. The blood of people cannot be. But the land will not cover the blood. Nothing will heal the pain here between the mountains of Jerusalem on the Haram Nuchot. You are buried here, brothers who came from far away, brothers from France, but also sons of Jerusalem. May your remembrance and may God avenge you. That was uh, President Reuven Rivlin eulogizing the victims of the Paris attack. We're going to get a quick update from our correspondent, Danny Swaibel, who is at the funeral. Hi, Danny. Thank you for joining us. What can you tell us from inside about the mood after these very, very uh, charged and, and painful words? Michal, sorry to interrupt. Actually, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, will be going to the microphone. We'll so we will be listening to him right now. All right. Going live to... Ruben Rivlin, the head of the opposition, member of parliament, Itzhak Buji Herzog, the minister of environment and energy of France, Segolan Royal, the chairman of the Jewish and the agency, Nathan Sharansky, the first of Zion, the rabbi, Itzhak Yosef, and the mayor and the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Lau, ministers, members of Knesset, ambassadors, leaders from France, and representatives of the General Assembly. The mayor of Jerusalem, Nir Barkat. The people of Israel, and above all, our brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, from the family of the bereaved. Here we saw. How big your pain is. How terrible your grief is. When I held you in Paris, I told you that I know your pain, the pain of spouses, of parents, the pain of children, of brothers and sisters, who lost their, what they cherished the most. 
And this is the way the nation of Israel and the state of Israel are holding you, embracing you with love on this day in which four new graves are, were buried in the ground of Jerusalem. They will be uh, the last resting place for Philip, Yoav, Yohan, and Francois Michel. May they rest in peace. Four dear people, honest, with love for men, four people who are like the other victims from Toulouse who are buried here were assassinated only because they are Jewish. Their lives were, were ended in a moment of hatred by a terrible assassin. But we shouldn't talk too much about the terrible, the damned assassin, and not about the other murderers who killed the lives of innocent on the in France, because their deeds show their bigotry, their murderous bigotry. It is the bigotry of the fundamental Islam terror movement that create terrible things all over the world. I've been saying for many years, and I'll say it again here today, these are not the enemies of the Jewish people alone. These are the enemies of humanity, all of humanity. And it's time for all of civilized men to join together and cut from the root these enemies from amongst us. I returned yesterday from Paris. I was in a march with leaders from all over the world. I think that most of them understand, or at least beginning to understand, that this terrorism, this terrorism of fundamental Islam is a real threat, a tangible threat for the security and peace of the world in which we live. And there in Paris, I also attended uh, or saw again the strength and the warmth of the community of the Jews of France, a community that contributed so much to France and which is connected from the mirror of its uh, heart to the people of Israel, to the Torah of Israel, and to land of Israel. This is the cord that was never cut, that promised our existence, and which is a secret, the secret of our resurrection. So in this, today we should focus on the spirit that lies here, the spirit that says never, you will never win over us. It is the strength of our people, its internal unity, the faith and uh, that, that ties us all. It is the source of our strength of an ancient people that overcame every peril and resurrected from the ashes and bless the Lord look around you here in the mountains of Jerusalem we have a country of our own a, a, a flourishing country a country that sheds, that is a beacon, a moral beacon 
for the rest of the world, a country that takes its fate in its own hands. And our president was right by saying that the Jews are allowed to live in many countries and their right is to live in everywhere in the world with complete security. But I believe that they know in the depth of their hearts that they have one country, one land, the state of Israel, which is their historical uh, origin and will welcome them as loved, as loved brothers and children. Today, more than ever, Israel is the real home of all of us. And as many we will, as will, as many we will be and united in our country, we will be stronger in our country, in our one country. And this is the hope of the Jewish people. May the soul of Philippe, Yoav, Johan, and François Michel be part of the story of life in the flourishing of our country, in the building of our country. May they rest in peace. And so a very uh, emotional uh, set of speeches uh, here in Jerusalem. Um, back in the studio, maybe uh, Mr. Frank, you can tell us a little, ba a little bit about the emotional uh, how do you deal emotionally um, with the victims? How do they? How do you support them and, and offer them the, the emotional support needed? And also, is it different to react uh, to such a an attack that happened in, in an event that happened in, in such a, a brutal and, and aggressive manner? What what kind of support do you offer the victims that, that some of them, uh, the family of the victims that some of them we saw in the funeral now? Well, Zaka have a team of counselors that we have uh, we have access to in the aspect of uh, family support and um, to also to notify the families I mean when a disaster happens not always do we know um, who the victims are and through our forensics and through our work we're able to identify the people we would then go and notify the families uh, through our special um, specialized units for this for the uh, for the victims themselves and for the families um, in in that aspect it's it's a team of probably about 15 to 20 people uh, that would actually console the families and sit with the families and we don't just support them in in the uh, emotional aspect we also help uh, prepare the families for the Shiva for the seven days of mourning we'll supply the chairs uh, the chairs of mourning will supply the Torah scrolls, will supply the Sidurim, and uh, any necessities that the family needs uh, for the Shiva, we will, su we will supply as well. So uh, Zaka's a massive, uh, has a massive variety of different uh, 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 units to be able to support the different needs in times of crisis. Uh, very difficult times indeed. Uh, we're going to go back live to just hear the prayer and then we'll have one more question for Ambassador Vital. A difficult day in Jerusalem, and I think for French Jews and for for yeah. everyone who believes in the same same values, world Jewry, but but not only. Um, <coughs> maybe we can touch a little bit upon the speeches of President Rivlin and Prime Minister Netanyahu. They both mentioned Aliyah um, in uh, different ways, uh, you can say. And the question is: Is this time? Is this the right? time to encourage Aliyah, what statement is this bringing forth? First of all, I, I'm all for Aliyah. It's obvious. I mean, uh, this is 
the gathering of Jews has always been a strategy, the strategy of the State of Israel. And when I was a member of parliament, I was the head of the uh, Aliyah and, and Absorption Committee, so obviously I, I'm telling you where my heart is. I'm not sure that this is the right moment, depending how you do it. Yes, we are an open country, and yes, hopefully this is the country where most Jewish people will choose to come. This is our Zionism, but I think that the way certain things were put in the past few days, telling the Jews of France that Israel is the only safe place for them, is really slapping the French president and the French people in their face. He's telling them you're incompetent. And I'm not sure that this is the right thing to do. Uh, just imagine, we were speaking of the Intifada, that during the Intifada, when all of us every day suffered in Jerusalem, we would have had the Prime Minister of France coming to <clears throat> one of the funerals or one of after one of the incidents and telling all the people who were of French descent, leave Israel and come to live in France. I think that there are certain very uh, thin nerves, very, very sensitive nerves that you don't touch at such moments. And it did uh, anger the French, as we know, uh, but we also know that this isn't the first time that a leader is calling for no, Aliyah. No, Ariel Sharon did it as well. Exactly. <clears throat> and he was equally reprimanded at that time. But uh, the way I saw and I listened to the speech of the president, I must say, <clears throat> it was extremely moving. Uh, the way that he addressed each one of the victims, the way that he reminded each one what their past had been. And the way he said, yes, but we understand also that you have a right to live as free citizens in the countries that you choose. And indeed, it is the duty of the governments of those countries to ensure your security. And to express their religious beliefs. That's correct. Which uh, today isn't the case. You know, one of the things that was uh, stated publicly, I think, today, yesterday, I'm losing um, control of time by the French Prime Minister, was to remind us all that it was after the French Revolution that the French people decided to emancipate the Jews, to give them equal rights, and that this business of La République and what you call in France laïcité, in a way it's secularism. Secularism, the fact that you are a citizen and you're not counted by your religion and that this has to be a secular state, has become in a way a religion of France, uh, uh, the ideology of France. So I think that governments usually don't make the difference between religions. But yes, some of us are still targeted everywhere where we are. And we have to be very, very vigilant and, and take precautions about that. Absolutely. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining me here, Ambassador Vital, Mr. Frenkel. This was a special edition here at I-24 News. We'll be back here in just a few moments uh, with uh, more guests and more questions, and of course, with live coverage from the funerals. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> בלב ליבו של הרובע היהודי. הוא נשבע בקסמיה של צרפת וערכי החירות והדמוקרטיה המייחדים אותה. לימים בית הכנסת שהקים שרד את השואה ואנשיו היו חלק מקהילה יהודית Hi. Okay. Oh, Yeah, Yeah, ספרי
Good afternoon. We're back here with the I-24 News special edition with the live coverage from the funerals in uh, Jerusalem of the uh, four victims from the Paris attack. Joining me now in studio is uh, Ambassador uh, Daniel Sheik, former Israeli ambassador to France, and uh, Rafael Yerushalmi, former Israeli intelligence officer. Thank you for being here with me this uh, afternoon. We just heard the, the speeches of uh, both President Rivlin and Prime Minister Netanyahu, a very emotional day for French Jews, for Jews around the world, and in fact, a very emotional day for, for a lot of people who, who believe in the values of freedom of speech, because this all began with the attack at Charlie Hebdo. Um, Ambassador uh, Sheikh, I'd like to begin with you. Hollande feared that uh, Netanyahu's presence at the rally that was held with uh, many world leaders would evoke perhaps uh, other subjects and kind of tilt the shift uh, uh, and the focus to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, based on your personal experience as Israel's ambassador, does this claim represent Israeli-French relations at the time and more so the direction these relations are going? I have to start by saying that I don't know that, that those are facts. Uh, I, nobody are knows reports. for a fact that these, uh, this, uh, this was uh, indeed uh, the message that came from Hollande's office. Uh, but I'd like to say, regardless of uh, support or no support for uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, I think it's not a reasonable thing uh, to uh, demand. Uh, from an Israeli prime minister not to be present in such an event, uh, if that, if if indeed that was the case, and uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, uh, should indeed have been uh, in the front row of these uh, world leaders who were marching uh, in Paris. Um, what might have been the case is um, maybe a case of bad uh, uh, precedent, uh, since uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu already traveled to France uh, in the wake of a, a murderous attack in Toulouse. And it was, again, uh, two years ago uh, during an election campaign. And some felt that he took advantage of this uh, tragedy in order to fuel his campaign. Uh, I will leave it to uh, each of our viewers to judge if uh, he did the same thing in this case or not. Uh, but uh, I think the bottom line is what counts. I think an Israeli personality, maybe it should have been the president, a less political figure, a more symbolic one, but it is uh, definitely the right and the prerogative of the prime minister to claim this role as the representative of the state of Israel at such an event. Absolutely. And I have to say that uh, even um, some of the other candidates uh, who were asked whether his presence was welcomed, uh, I I've heard a uh, a vast uh, amount of response saying that there should there should have yeah, been I think and, everybody and it was uh, agreed. in the you place. Could, uh, you, the timing, you might of argue course, that maybe the presence of two more cabinet ministers, each from a different party, may not have been crucial. Uh, but the main figure, the prime minister, I think even uh, uh, head of the opposition, uh, Bougie Herzog, uh, had no claim against that. Absolutely. We're going to quickly go uh, for a live update from our diplomatic correspondent, Tal Shalev, who's standing by at the funeral. Tal, what's the latest? Well, uh, um, uh, Michal, the uh, funeral is underway. We have already heard the Israeli president and the Israeli prime minister uh, and the head of the, the leader of the opposition, Itzhak Herzog, all of them gave the address in a short while. The French representative uh, uh, minister, the ecology minister, and uh, a former candidate, presidential candidate in 2007, Ségolène Royal, will be speaking to the crowds. There's a very large crowd here comprised mainly uh, of, of, out of the uh, French Jewish community, but also so from many Israeli uh, citizens who have arrived here by themselves. This is the actually, um, as uh, Mr. Shek, as Ambassador Shek mentioned, this is the, the, the second time in a few years, in three years, in almost three years, that uh, the French community is having such a tragic event, tra tra such a tragic funeral here at the uh, cemetery uh, um, in March 2012. Also, the victims of the Toulouse uh, attack were uh, brought to rest, brought to final rest here. And uh, the similarities are very clear, even though when, you, when I remember and when I 
recall speaking to the uh, French jury that was uh, um, uh, that attended that funeral and those who are attending this funeral, you can definitely feel a different uh, trend coming, a different feelings. Uh, it does seem that this event has increased the fear, has increased the concern, and in many ways might encourage, as uh, um, as uh, many in the French uh, uh, government are uh, concerned, it might encourage a much more vast uh, uh, majority, um, a much more vast and uh, swift immigration uh, wave of immigration to Israel. Thank you, Tal Shalev, for that update. And indeed, we did speak about uh, a wave of, of immigration and the call for aliyah that is being made at this moment. And, and I'd like to hear your opinion, Ambassador Sheikh, as someone who's lived and who knows the, the culture in France. What is your opinion about aliyah at this time? Of course, all uh, Jews are welcome to Israel, but right now, calling for aliyah, what message is this sending? And, and more so, is there a future for French Jews in France? Well, if the answer were no to that question, then I think uh, the French uh, Republic had no uh, right to exist anymore. And I think that that is the view that uh, Israelis should take of it. These are French citizens of Jewish faith who are profoundly connected to Israel in this order. And that's the healthy order for them to live in France. The responsibility for their well-being for, their, for the fact that they will be welcome in the community is the responsibility of French authority and of the French, uh, f French society. And I think that uh, in the wake of an unprecedented uh, show of solidarity and of attachment to the core values of French society, which include the emancipation of the Jews, it is an unfair treatment to uh, accuse the French of not uh, being attentive enough to the well-being of the uh, Jewish community. I think that President Hollande, uh, every French uh, dignitary, the press, the intellectual elites, all of them have embraced the Jewish community. And moreover, I know for a fact that that is how the Jews in France consider it. Now, having said all that, there are many Jews in France who want to come to Israel. And we should all, as Israelis, I think it's the most natural thing that we should welcome them with open arms. But I think it puts them in an uncomfortable position if we are those who are pushing them. They don't need to be pushed. Those who want to come are convinced for better reasons than just uh, an attack uh, in, 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 a, in a Jewish supermarket. So uh, in a moment, I do want to talk uh, again uh, a little more about the, the feeling of safety uh, of the Jewish community in France. But uh, Mr. Yerushami, I'm wondering what, what your opinion is on the deployment of thousands of troops in France, on the streets, in institutions. For Israelis, maybe this sounds normal. But in Europe, this is completely uh, unique. And, and, and I don't know if unique is the word. It's, it's completely not a part of the usual landscape. Do you think this is a new reality that uh, people will have to deal with? Uh, I do think so. I think the French uh, have to understand now that they are in danger. They haven't done it in the past. They have uh, procrastinated for quite a few years as maybe they are ready to face the reality and to face the enemy. I have not noticed yet that they are naming the enemy as such yet. Uh, they are still using a kind of vocabulary uh, that shows that they are still cautious. Uh, they hesitate to um, uh, use certain terms uh, as Arab or Islamic or terrorist even. They, pre they still use militant. And uh, to just to point something that mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador Sheikh said, uh, you have to remember that the, the, the Jews do not feel that good in France lately. But it has nothing to do with security or the French Republic. It has to do with an overall atmosphere, mostly uh, because of the French media, uh, that uh, continuously attacks Israel, continuously uh, accuses uh, the Israeli government or even the Israeli army of uh, war crimes, continuously only takes the side of the Palestinians. Well, this it's, it's very, hard to make such a generalization, but some no, people do absolute, feel this believe way. Believe me, as a journalist, you should know it. If you take the French media, it's 80% of the French media are anti-Israeli 
and that's it. Whether it's Le Monde, whether it's Liberation, Antenne 2, in England it's the BBC, we just had a scandal, one of the many scandals, uh, the Jewish uh, communities in England, in France, and especially in Belgium, uh, where there it's for sure uh, a very strong uh, anti-Israeli press. The Jews there uh, are not very happy with that. They open the newspapers to see terrible accusations of Israel. But Mr. Rushalmi, I don't think that the media is the basis of their feelings. And I'd like to pose a question to both of you asking, what can the government do and how should they act right now to ensure that feeling of safety? Because not everyone is going to make aliyah and uh, the media is uh, a, a, a tool of free speech, so we cannot change well, the media, the, but the government can take certain well, the actions. The measures are very simple. The, the first measure, even though it might, might look psychological to deploy so many troops around, that these troops should be visible or these policemen, uh, it's very good. Uh, it, it, it keeps people on a state of alert. People would be more vigilant because they see there is some kind of danger if there are so many troops around. It gives them a kind uh, of feeling of safety, which is good, to avoid uh, panic or fear. Uh, on, on the other hand, other measures, real measures, have to be taken. The first one, uh, we have mentioned the efficiency or inefficiency of the security service uh, of France. Their efficiency is not in question. There is a problem of budget and a problem of staff. Uh, the government has immediately to vote much more budget and uh, devote much more staff and train more staff to, count, uh, to fight terrorism. They also have to change the legislation in France. Okay, just many if laws. we can get a quick yes. also comment okay. from Ambassador Sheck and then we're going to go live. Well, I'm, I'm much less an expert on the exact measures to be taken, but I think that they need to be on three levels. They need to be on the um, uh, policing, military, intelligence, uh, law enforcement side, definitely. They need to be in legislation, but they also need to be to on social and uh, educational issues. We're going to listen to the Tikva and we'll be right back with you. Sophia, od That was uh, the end of the funeral ceremony. We're back here in studio with uh, Ambassador Sheik and Mr. Yerushalmi. Thanks for being here, staying with me. Again, I'd like to talk about uh, what we left off with, what the government can do, because I don't mean it just in a security standpoint. There is a clear divide in society, which is just widening. What can the government do at this point to not only retrieve the sense of, of security for French citizens, because it's not just a Jewish problem. The attack, to remind you, uh, 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 last week began with the attack on Charlie Hebdo, which was not Jewish, and of course, uh, uh, later on, a, a Jewish uh, uh, supermarket was targeted specifically, but this is more about citizens at large and, and, and citizens of the West who believe in free speech. Is it, is it too late? You know, is, uh, is, there, is, is there something that uh, the government could do at this point? Or, you know, maybe, uh, maybe at this point, the uh, military enforcement is, is the only way. More uh, forces on the street. No, I, I mean, it is a necessary measure, but it's not sufficient. Uh, look, for ex after 9-11, worldwide uh, uh, travel habits have changed. People got used to um, more stringent uh, security controls in airports, uh, to more intrusive questioning on also when they apply for a visa. All sorts of things changed. I think that things will have to change in France too. I don't 
I'm not in a position to tell you exactly what. That's not my domain. But I think that if some kind of mental a uh, penny uh, must drop in the minds of uh, French citizens today, it is that this event will necessarily have an impact on their everyday uh, life and they have to accept it. On the other hand, if you strip yourself of all the uh, freedoms and the uh, values uh, of uh, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of move movement, human rights, etc., etc., in order to fight your enemies, then what are you fighting for? And so then you, you need to lost. strike a balance. It's very simple. A, democra a liberal democracy has every right to acquire the tools and the weapons to defend itself. But it shouldn't go overboard. Now, uh, the entire uh, the value system and the idea of the European Union, free and open borders, uh, Maybe this is also something that it's at stake. But the question is, is this really a moment that will change? People are comparing it to 9-11, but it's not exactly the same scale. Will it have the same impact and the same imprint on the, f the French history? Uh, or will this be, sorry to say, maybe forgotten in a few days, a tragic event that took place, and life will move on until the next tragic event takes place? Uh, hopefully this scenario might not be the best one but maybe it's not such a bad one that people will go back to their lives and forget uh, those who should not forget uh, and that's what i hoped this huge demonstration in paris might have done uh, with uh, some public opinion pressure is the leaders the, those who are responsible for security and the leaders they shouldn't forget uh, we speak a lot about what happened in france but in, it's a world problem. France cannot fight it alone. France cannot solve it alone, even for its own internal security. It has to be dealt with uh, in an international manner, in a cooperation with all the countries that are uh, threatened by uh, jihad. And uh, it is true, like Ambassador Sheikh said, that the root of the problem lies very deep. And it's, there are many measures who should be long-term measures, starting with education, uh, changing uh, the atmosphere uh, in the society, uh, creating more tolerance, more understanding, uh, examining Islam in a new light. Uh, all these things are very, very long-term measures. Uh, Meanwhile, the there is, is an emergency situation. The emergency situation requires an immediate military response. Because the root of the problem, as we said very deep, is not in France. The root of the problem is here in Syria and Iraq. And it needs an immediate military measure that doesn't threaten in any way democracy. Maybe the new measures at the borders, many countries, uh, principally Spain, have asked uh, to tighten the controls at the borders, change the Schengen arrangements that allow European citizens to move free across all the borders. They want to slow that down. Uh, many some measures create an ethical dilemma as to how far you can go uh, to protect your security as uh, threatening human uh, freedom and privacy. But a military operation against ISIS, uh, a worldwide co collaboration of intelligence services to fight Al Qaeda is absolutely required. It hasn't been done until now in a serious manner, in a concerted manner. Uh, the, all the countries have to gather. France cannot uh, be alone. It's not in a vacuum. It has allies. They have to work together and they have to target, first of all, the military target, because that uh, can be done in a few weeks, in a few months, but that uh, problem can be dealt with. We'll talk a little bit more about the intelligence side, but first we'll get a quick update from our correspondent, Danny Swibel, who's uh, standing within the funeral. It looks like people are uh, starting to, to uh, uh, spread and, and leave the, the premises. What can you tell us from inside? Uh, it's been a very charged and emotional past hour. Uh, what, what's happening inside and, and as far as the mood and, and the people and the reactions you've been hearing, Danny? Well, Michal, as you can imagine, it's a very somber atmosphere here. Hundreds of people came out and gathered 
Some people bared uh, Israeli flags. Other people had signs. Uh, you could imagine the signs that we've seen over the course of the week. This sweet Charlie, is this sweet Juif. I am Charlie. I'm Jewish. As well as I am Yoav and Johan, uh, two of the victims in the butcher shop on Friday. Um, we got to hear from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, as well as the Israeli president, uh, family members of the people of uh, who the victims had spoken and had really uh, said in words. Um, we spoke to friends of Yoav and Johan, two of the victims, and they were obviously still in shock, still in complete uh, dismay over what had happened. So as it stands, we are currently getting ready for the funeral procession. And we uh, will we'll update you as uh, things progress here. Danny, how did people react to the speeches? Very uh, charged. Uh, President Rivlin was, was speaking individually about every victim. Uh, both the president and the prime minister mentioned Aliyah. What, what did you see in the crowd? The crowd was touched. The crowd was touched by the, some of the things the president had said specifically, um, as well as some points from Benjamin Netanyahu over the unity of Jews worldwide. That uh, Jews are an ancient people who persevere through these things, and together that uh, people will persevere. Uh, some of the French people I'd spoken to appreciated that Israel is the home of all Jews, and uh, that Israel looks at itself as a moral beacon. Um, but mostly I noticed people were extremely touched by some of the families who had spoke. The wife of Didi Braham spoke, and um, Didi had three children at home, so people here were definitely devastated. You could see it in their actions, and you could see it in their eyes that they were crushed by, uh, you know, the, the falling of this person on Friday. And uh, that's where it stands here on the ground. Thank you, Danny. We'll be back uh, with you for more updates. Um back here at the studio. Uh, Ambassador Sheikh, French politics will clearly be affected by these past week's um, attacks, two attacks, which might even bring to the, the rise, and we're already seeing it, of more right-wing uh, extremism within the political parties. What do you expect to happen politically? There's still some time that the French elections will be held in 2017, but, but what do you think will happen in the coming months, in the coming years? The natural course of events, unfortunately, is that extremes feed on each other. So the more extreme the uh, Islamic terrorism becomes or the behavior of the Muslim community, the more it feeds into the extreme right and vice versa. That's the natural course of events. And that is why it's uh, so important for uh, President Hollande to follow through in, his, in the leadership that he has shown so far in the public domain, in the ceremonial, emotional, symbolic domain of the Great March, uh, and to uh, take charge of what is happening and not leave the debate about immigration, about the Muslim community, uh, in the hands of the extremists. He can do it. I think that today French society is clearly more ripe and uh, to understand the necessity of such a, such a debate in the mainstream of politics, and that goes for the Socialist Party of uh, President Hollande, but also for the main opposition party, the right-wing uh, UMP. Uh, it, may be, it, it may be a moment of truth for President Hollande. He has done very well so far, but the big test lies ahead. And how would you react uh, to the, the rise of Pegida in Germany? Just last night there was a rally, an anti-Islam uh, rally, the rise of Marie Le Pen. How, uh, how is society going to react to these events? It's, as you said, it's the, the natural uh, way to go, but the rise of extremism, where is this going to take Marine Europe? Le Pen, Marine Le Pen and the uh, Front National weren't born uh, last weekend. I mean, they exist for many, many years, and their rise in power um, is not directly linked only to the question of Muslim immigration. It's one of the issues. But the main issue that they are feeding on is the economic crisis, the social crisis, the identity crisis that French society is going through. And of course, the events of last weekend, of the last week, feed into that. And that's exactly why I'm saying it's important for the mainstream political leaders to take charge of this political debate and not leave it in the hands of the extremists especially that they feed on racism and that they will add uh, 
hold Muslims or Jews of France responsible. They will always say that the problems that France is, is suffering are because of the, of the foreigners, yes. the others, the non-French. And uh, for the sake of the debate, only, the Jews are just as absolutely. others as the Muslims. Yeah, and not only the uh, National Front was not born yesterday, uh, Extremism and xenophobia in France have a very long standing very tradition. True. I would say from the Dreyfus affair, you can see that France has always been divided in two camps on that matter. Absolutely. Now, most, I think you can say, most immigrants have assimilated. Um, they're proud of Frenchmen. Many immigrants who, who came and were, were able to have a new life because of the immigration policies there that uh, uh, currently hold. Um, but the problem is that some who are second, third, fourth generation have not. And their entire communities and, and neighborhoods that are completely detached. And how can the government deal with a situation where there's two completely different realities taking place in one country? Well, uh, I think both sides bear responsibility for that development, for the, the situation that you just described. Both the French state, who neglected the effort needed in order to integrate the first generation and second generation of immigrants, and then the third and the fourth feel completely neglected and out of the loop from uh, French society. But there's also a responsibility that lies on the shoulders of the immigrants themselves, who in many cases, not all of them of course, but in many cases, don't want to integrate. They don't want to be French. They want to be Algerians, Moroccans who live in France. That's they just want to a geographical. Some of them don't even speak. Many um, of them the, don't the speak language. French. They don't. They don't. They don't feel solidarity uh, in any way to French values, etc. So, the trick is to now. I think the, the 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 biggest challenge is to try and associate the majority of moderate uh, peace uh, seeking. Uh, Muslim immigrants into the effort to fight the extremists. You have to pull them into your camp and not let them drift into the wake of the of the extremist uh, uh, preachers and uh, and uh, terrorists. Are there success stories as far as immigration? Well, maybe say uh, Osama. There are many. Yes, of course, many. many success stories. Uh, you wouldn't, the same way as you couldn't uh, dream of a, a black American president a few years ago, you couldn't dream of a Muslim woman minister of justice. Absolutely, Rashida Dati. Uh, Rashida Dati. Yes. This was un uh, unthinkable a few years ago. If, if I may say, uh, I, w I, w I would be very careful. Uh, we are speaking of b racism, amalgam. I would be very careful of. Uh, analyzing this uh, problem through That's the right. lens of integration. So I, we're, we're going to take a okay. short break, but uh, we'll be back here in just two minutes in this I-24 News special edition. Thank you. Don't go anywhere.
Good afternoon. We're uh, still here at the I-24 News Special Edition. And uh, still in studio is Mr. Yerushalmi. Thank you for still being here with me. And uh, Dr. Miriam Roseman, who joined us, an expert on France-Israel relations. Very relevant right now, uh, and, and we'll be hearing a lot about what you have to say. Just before the break, uh, we were discussing some of the uh, immigration, and, and we were cut off. So uh, perhaps you, you'd like to finish. We are talking about the the immigration and the second third and, and fourth generation in france and how they can integrate within society right uh, first of all i I, sh I would say that uh, the muslim community has pretty well integrated in the french society and uh, uh, what we see uh, the most visible is the bad side of that community and we never see really all the rest uh, it is integrated, uh, but even that part that is not integrated, that remains disconnected, sometimes willingly, uh, ideologically or religiously, uh, I would be careful uh, not to point always the finger uh, towards it, uh, because we have a tendency to think that uh, uh, the, the terrorists, for instance, or the extremists, are only recruited in that layer of society in the suburbs of Paris. And it is true, there are many petty thieves, uh, many delinquents uh, go, living in those areas. Uh, but saying this is the place where uh, terrorists are recruited is not exactly true. I will remind you, like, uh, for instance, here in our region, that many students in campuses coming from the middle and upper middle class are very virulent followers of uh, jihad, of extremist movements. The same way as we have Palestinian students in Haifa, Jerusalem, Ramallah, supporting Hamas. So there the are ideology France, isn't just yes, with the there are, uh, very Muslim uh, intellectuals weak in part. France who are moderate, but there are many of them who are not, uh, who are outspoken uh, uh, leaders, outspoken uh, orators, that they certainly do not come from the suburbs. So I think that's yet another uh, prejudice we should avoid, uh, even though it, there is, for sure, an integration but problem. Only. But the French might say today, isn't there an integration problem if Jews uh, ask to be buried in Jerusalem? Absolutely. It's a good question to be asked. Dr. Roseman, how will these events and this past week, which uh, has, is still keeping a lot of people in shock, affect Israeli-French relations? Actually, I hope it's going to calm down, because from my point of view, what Netanyahu did on Saturday, and it started like a boule de neige, we say in French, it started to fall. It's snowball. not it, Yes, yeah, snowball. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, Sharon did it before in 2002, and Chirac was very upset with this, and there was a lot of, long sto uh, a lot of stories behind it. The speech of Netanyahu on La Victoire on Sunday was a bit less firm like it was on Saturday, but still, um, I think Israel, if they want to come, welcome. I'll be the first one to be happy if they come, but it's their choice. It's not us who has to come and to tell them. And I have to say one figure. In 2014, there were 7,000 uh, immigrants from Jewish community in France who came to Israel. It's doubled because in 2013, there were 3,000 and something. And before the attack, I say before Friday, mm -hmm. there were supposed to be 10,000 in 2015. And we have to remember something more. It's not just anti-Semitism. Of course, it is also one of the uh, triggers. But the economic in France is in a very bad situation. The situ whole sit social situation in France is not good. So. And I think this is something that we have to take in account. But it's interesting uh, because economically in Israel, it's also a, a very big question. Where will they work? People here aren't, you know, they, jobs aren't exactly flourishing. So even uh, in Israel, a lot are quick to make aliyah. But um, I wouldn't say that uh, it seems that the economy isn't the main reason. And speaking to people in the French uh, Jewish community, it's more a feeling of urgency and, and fear that's causing them to get up and leave. Um, but back to the political aspect and whatever implications this can have on uh, Israeli and French relations, uh, France seemed angered by, uh, by some of the things that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said. And um, what I'm wondering is, 
the, the rally, which of, of course we mentioned here earlier was very important for Israeli presence, was the invitation uh, to President Abbas a certain hint to Israel. From my point of view, first of all, for this demonstration should be another delegation of Israel. I think instead of Lieberman and Netanyahu having this small fight under quotation, who will go and if they will go, I think they should have prepared a nice, another delegation like President Rivlin should be there and other dignitaries from my point of view. Uh, that's what I think personally. Obviously, uh, during the demonstration, we've seen some things which disturbed me as an Israeli, and I don't go, I'm not going to repeat them. All of us saw them. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and I think there is another symbol. Uh, François Hollande left La Victoire before Netanyahu's speech. Uh, it's another which is issue, very, which uh, another, it's saying something without yes. saying, but, saying but, uh, Segolene Royal is the minister who came to speak to today, and she is somebody who is very known in Israel because she was running for presidency, but her speech was very moderate, she was very warm, she, she really maybe in a way calmed, you know, they sent someone who won't mm -hmm. put fire some more fire, but calm down the things. And again, I don't think it's not the role of Israel to tell them to come. They're welcome. Obviously, there will be a problem. One thing I, I agree with Mr. Netanyahu that he said on Saturday, we have to build a bureau. We have to build kind of a bureau to help them. Because right now, there's lots of problem with this aliyah. It's a very uh, good aliyah, wealthy. They have uh, professions. Um, they are, there are problems with their degrees here. There are problems with the, the doctors. There are problems with different kind of, of professions. And if we really want to help them to integrate in our society, what we should do is really build a bureau and to help them, but not to tell them to come. They have to do their cho their own choice, and some of them are not coming to Israel. Some of them are leaving France for the States or for Canada, and it's their choice. And it's uh, an important time, perhaps, for uh, the governments to cooperate, because if we go back not that long ago, a week, it was really uh, an attack on uh, the values that Israel and France do share. Now, I'd like to talk about uh, the intelligence uh, aspect, which uh, you're a, a former uh, intelligence officer. Reports that came in, uh, which haven't been confirmed, but Algerian intelligence services told France one day before the attack on Charlie Hebdo that there was uh, an attack to take place within 24 hours. They even sent the identities of uh, the attackers. And if this is correct, it's a very, very um, big and severe uh, intelligence uh, failure. So... Uh, well, the answer is very simple. Uh, it depends who and at what level of the chain of command received that message. Who was in a position reading it to understand it fully, uh, to, to take a decision. The decision can just be to show it to somebody else. Uh, or to push it up uh, the echelons. Uh, this, this is the main question, if this is true. Who received the message? Through what channels? Uh, the, the point is that in the present state of things, it is any information you get of that nature should, of course, be dealt with seriously. Every hoax should not be considered a hoax before it's sure it's a hoax. Uh, the cooperation between most uh, services is very tight right now. We said there is a need for more, but it does exist. It exists uh, in the, uh, the secret services, Interpol, many uh, uh, establishment, intelligence security establishments collaborate, and that might create uh, an overflow of the information. The Israelis might have come with information. The Americans might have come with information. Uh, maybe there is, I'm sorry to say, sometimes a bit of uh, snobbery. If you get an information for the Mossad, you will look at it more than from the Algerians. Uh, no offense, but that's how it works. Uh, all, so all this uh, creates probably a lot, a lot of information. Today, uh, the cyber war uh, is absolutely ginormous. There are millions of people employed in attacking and defending uh, Internet sites and computer uh, it's networks. a main subject uh, worldwide. And in that, uh, you lose a little the, the focus on the main things, on what could be an emergency and what is not an emergency. In that particular case, I will say, 
flow of information. Uh, maybe it was lost in it. Maybe the person who received it uh, is not senior enough to understand the full scope. Uh, that, that's my explain. possible explanation. We'll talk about this a little more, but first we're going to go live to our diplomatic correspondent, Tal Shalev, who is standing by uh, right outside uh, where the funeral is held. Tal, please give us an update. Well, Michal, uh, the official part of the ceremony is over, and now the families and uh, relatives and friends are accompanying their, uh, uh, the four victims of the Hiper Kasher attack to their final rest. Uh, the bodies are being transferred to the graves that are in a different part of the Haram Nuchot Cemetery, where this uh, uh, ceremony and funeral has been taking place. It was a very uh, um, dignified and very moving emotional ceremony. We heard uh, statements um, from the uh, um, Israeli president, Reuven who says that terror never kept the Jewish people down, but and it, we will not let it subdue us today. And he also uh, tells the, Fr the, G the French Jews that the uh, terror should not subdue them and that Israel is their home. We hear the Israeli Prime Minister reiterate the message that leaders of the world are now starting to understand the grave danger for all mankind, not only for the Jewish people, that the uh, terror of the radical Islam is imposing. And we also hear uh, the uh, uh, French representative, the former presidential candidate, and current uh, ecology minister, Ségolène Royal, who does say a uh, vow that France will fight anti-Semitism, but also declares that uh, the French uh, president will be giving the, uh, the uh, four victims of this attack the highest medal honor of the French legionary uh, army. And this uh, is, of course, a very uh, strong act of solidarity and of unity coming from the French government, even though all of the, uh, all of the victims are not Israeli citizens. The Israeli prime minister did offer and insist to bring them to their final burial here in uh, Israel. And they have been brought to rest here in the Haram Nuchot Cemetery in a very tragic way, a place that is already well known to French jury from uh, uh, almost three years ago when the victims of uh, the Toulouse uh, school attack were also brought to final rest here. Tal, do you think today marks a warming in Israeli-French relations? Well, I think uh, this whole uh, uh, event does uh, touch uh, and does uh, catch Israel and France and Jerusalem and Paris in the midst of a very tense diplomatic era. Um, in the past few months, the uh, French president has been, and French foreign minister Laurent Fabius, have been uh, um, be being very much, much more involved in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace process and not in the way that causes much satisfaction here in Jerusalem. French has been very supportive of the Palestinian uh, statehood, uh, UN Security Council, bid, and this has caused a lot of anger here in, uh, is in uh, Jerusalem. And it was also a very tense visit this week by the Israeli Prime Minister to France. I wouldn't take uh, this event um, and, uh, and reflect on it, try to uh, de define from these hours, these very painful hours, hours of grieving and not hours of politics. And even, uh, even though politics was very much present in the past few days during Netanyahu's visit to France, today at the funeral it was much more subtle. You could not hear uh, here. You could not really feel the politics, but much more the collective pain and the collective embrace that the Israeli society is also uh, um, embracing these victims. Thank you very much, Tal Shalev, for this update from uh, the funeral. Unfortunately, uh, this is wrapping up our time. This is all the time we have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rafael Yerushalmi, for your insight and for being here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Miriam Roseman, for your insight and for being with thank us really you. all week. Um, telling us and, and giving us more uh, insight on the Israeli-French relations, which uh, hopefully are going in, in a, a good and, and warming direction, as Tal mentioned, from Jerusalem. Uh, this has been a very emotional day for many in Israel, in France, and, and, and worldwide for anyone who believes in the same core values that uh, were attacked. We're going to end with uh, visuals from the funeral. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here for this I-24 News special edition. Thank you for watching.
of course, you're there um, supporting Aliyah, but uh, what can you tell us about these past few days and your activities and the community and how they're dealing with the situation? Um, as a director of the Shomer Seir movement, uh, which is the youth movement in the community, uh, we spoke with our we spoke with our counselors, spoke with our uh, younger kids about uh, the situation. Uh, we didn't have an activity last uh, Saturday uh, due to uh, security reasons, but we still had an activity with our counselors. Uh, it's uh, it's a hard uh, hard atmosphere, um, especially today with. Um, Especially today, um, we're all a bit uh, sad and uh, thinking about uh, those who have died in the past events. Uh, but with uh, with all of that and the fact that uh, the Jewish agency is supporting Aliyah, um, we're also thinking about what's next. What's what's the future for the Jewish community here in Paris? Which and, is also uh, very raise, important. And, and, and what can, what can you of, tell uh, us? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Continue. And, uh, with the race. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jonathan, what um, can you tell us about dealing with the French community that does want to stay in France, that feels connected to Israel, but sees their life in Paris, in France, as a French Jew, which should also be possible for those who want to stay in their homeland? So yesterday we had actually a meeting with uh, most of the youth movement uh, here, in, uh, here in Paris. Uh, and after uh, 30 minutes of talking about security, we started talking about what's next. And uh, I think that the first thing that came uh, to everybody's mind, and I was sure that I was the one who's going to propose is someone who's coming from Israel, um, we talked about dialogue. We talked about uh, how, how we're going to reach now the Muslim uh, community. And I think um, there's a French philosopher, Bernard Henri Lévy, who spoke about uh, the fear of uh, Islamophobia and uh, the fact that he doesn't want to see the French nation and the Jewish community <coughs> uh, going against the Muslim uh, community right now uh, here in France. Um, but I think that the main, the main thing is that there are a lot of people who are saying we're here to stay, we're here to fight uh, our lives, and uh, we, won't, we won't be afraid and frightened by terror, and we will stand our guards uh, in front of... Uh, the Islamic terror, the radical Islamic terror, uh, who came to our front door. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan Hefetz from Paris. Now, uh, Mr. Franke, we're, we're going back to you. Uh, we're going to show some live footage from the funeral. Can you explain to us, maybe a little bit from a, a ritual standpoint, what we're seeing uh, taking place at the funeral and what we can expect? Well, the, the services that uh, uh, that we're seeing at the moment right now, um, if I'm not mistaken, is the uh, the mayor uh, of Jerusalem. The, the sure. mayor of Jerusalem. Yeah, the mayor of Jerusalem, together with um, one of uh, the one of the I think the family, family members, members seems, of yeah. um, of the uh, terrorist attack. Now, the way we would work at at the funeral is the bodies are brought out as you, as we saw earlier. My uh, our proud members. Um, four uh, per body, bringing them out to the stage uh, or to the platform, I should say. Um, followed by Kaddish, uh, we would also have, uh, and because of the intensity of this specific funeral, we have different dignitaries speaking as well, giving their eulogies. But then we would also have the Kail Malaya Khamim, which is the, uh, um, the mourners' uh, uh, prayer, so to say. And then we will actually take the bodies to uh, mm, bury them into uh, mm. in the ground. And the reason why we do that is because of one of the things that the Torah says, which is when the, per the same way a person is brought into the world, so too shall they return. And because we're one family. Now, for our viewers and, and for all of us to understand maybe and have a little insight into your work, can you tell us about the procedure from Paris until the moment the bodies arrived, the victims' bodies arrived here in uh, Jerusalem. If you can take us through just a little bit. Sure. Um, Friday afternoon, we heard of the. Uh, uh, we've initially heard of the terrorist attack, at which point my counterpart uh, Matty Goldstein, who happens to be the uh, the head of the Zaka International teams, um, was dealing with finding out how many members there were, how many, uh, sorry, how many victims there were, um, dealing with the foreign ministry, dealing with uh, the, our members on the scene. Zaka actually have 26 different countries uh, where we have teams. 
France is one of them and our members were on the scene pretty much right away and they were uh, relaying back to us, whether it be myself or my counterpart, uh, uh, Mati, uh, regarding the incident and regarding what's going on. Um, after Shabbat, we had a, another briefing with Rabbi Yehuda Meshizav, who's the chairman, um, otherwise known as the angel behind Zaka. Incredible person, really. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, it was decided on uh, Sunday we will get the flight at the uh, 5.30 flight uh, Lal, um, to Paris, which would get us there about 9 o'clock in the evening, 9.30. My guys were already, uh, my Israeli team was already on the scene at the uh, Hippokosha uh, supermarket. Once they got in, they did the holy task of uh, collecting the, the remains. Now, something that you should know, being over here in Israel, we don't see this. But when my members walked in to the Hippokosha, people were just astounded from people from all walks of life, whether religious or whether not, those who don't even know anything about religion, were there to support their Jewish brethren. And the most amazing thing that actually happened there was they all supported our members who were going in there to do the holy work, unknown to what they're going into, how bad the scenes are. We're going in with the support from the public. We're going in with the support from our communities. And that alone helps us to get through it. Once we finished uh, with the cleanup, the bodies, uh, we, we, our teams went then to the equivalent of Abu Kabir, the uh, forensics uh, department there, to deal with the um, cleanup, so to say, over there, to prepare the bodies for um, transport to Israel to be buried. In fact, to note, my teams are still there, still dealing with the cleanup. Okay, and uh, we're actually going to go to some live footage now from uh, France. I think we have a feed. Here we are. Um, we can see a memorial ceremony that is also taking place at the moment. Uh, Ambassador Vital, um, if we stick uh, still with the, the experience of uh, the victims, and we can see, sorry, a moment of silence here uh, taking place in uh, France. Uh, Ambassador Vital, the, the victims are experiencing this grief and, and their funeral, which is something very personal, has become something of a national scale, something maybe politicized. Do you think, in a way, it's coming at the expense of the bereaved families, this large national-scale uh, ceremony? <clears throat> no, I think that, um, first of all, I have to say that I am moved. I'm moved by everything that I see, and I'm moved that the scene that we see now at soldiers standing uh, uh, on guard for the funeral. Uh, and. I think that it must be a comfort for the family. Obviously, you know, many scenes have passed through my head. During the second intifada, many of us would go out in the morning, uh, go to a supermarket or go uh, to a restaurant, and we never knew if we would come out alive. And I remember that on a daily basis. And I remember so many of my friends and, and people that I knew well. Thank you uh, once again for joining me, Ambassador Vital and uh, Mr. Frankel. Before we begin, we're going to get a quick update from our diplomatic correspondent, Tal Shalev, who is in Jerusalem, uh, right outside the funeral. Tal, what can you tell us from there? Well, uh, good afternoon, Michal. Thousands of people have gathered here at the uh, Haram Nuchot Cemetery in Jerusalem, and the uh, uh, ceremony is expected to start shortly. Everyone is paying their final respect to the four victims of the hyper attack on Friday in Paris, and uh, um, the coffins of uh, the four victims, uh, Yoram Khatav, Yohan Cohen, Philippe Bram, and uh, Francois Michel uh, Salame, have, uh, uh, Saada, excuse me, ha uh, arrived early this morning. Uh, seems like we've been uh, cut off, so we shall begin, and we'll be back uh, later with live coverage from the funeral. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start with you, Ambassador Vital. Um, the families decided to bury the victims in Israel while they still live in France. Some of them might make aliyah, but at the moment they're all living in France. Could this possibly be because of their anger towards the French government? 
I don't think so. I think that probably it is it denotes also of their attachment to Israel, to what Israel represents, to what this land represents. But I really like to use this opportunity to present my condolences. I'm sure everybody feels like me to the families, and I do know that one of the uh, victims of the attack is the father of one of the producers here yes. at this station. So from all our heart, I think we all, this is a sad moment for all of us. Indeed. Thank you. It is a very sad moment also for all of us at I-24 News. Um, Mr. Frankel, uh, which brings me, me to you, Zaka. I think you probably have one of the most difficult jobs in the world. You're the first to arrive at most crisis uh, scenes to give the immediate response. What can you tell us a little bit about the procedures and about Zaka, what you stand for? Zaka was founded in 1979 when a terrorist boarded the 405 bus which travels across, uh, across Kvish uh, where the terrorist actually approached the driver, pulled the stone wheel to the right, which rolled the bus over the ravine, killing 17 people instantly. Since its inauguration, we've been, we've branched out into many different uh, divisions, whether it's from rescue to standard life-saving. We first responders under Magen David Adom, um, we run by the slogan of saving those who can be saved and honoring those who can't. Are uh, special measures taken for victims of terror? For sure. Special measures are taken in when everybody runs away from a terrorist scene, we're the ones actually running into it. Um, it's not an easy thing for us. It's one of the hardest things. And what gives me more courage is actually seeing our fellow members, you know, standing side by side to support each other. Um, Before I talk about the the victims, I, I do mm -hmm. want to talk more about the volunteers. It, it must take a psychological toll, and, and what I'm wondering, uh, you are a volunteer. How do volunteers deal with the, the psychological standpoint based on this line of work? We, I'll, I'll put it like this, when we go out and save a life, I know that person can turn around and thank us. But if I'm getting that call for a dead person, I know if that dead person is going to turn around and thank me, I'm going to run the other way. The only way that we actually um, support ourselves and, and deal with the uh, crisis is once we deal with a major disaster, uh, for instance, the Harnoff uh, shooting, two days after the, the uh, terrorist attack, we had a divuv, we had a, a uh, briefing where we actually sit down with um, trained professionals, psychologists, to debrief us on the situation, which helps us. But the most important thing to know is that Every member supports each other. We are one. Good afternoon and welcome to this I-24 News special edition. Today, the four French Jews who were killed in last week's terror attack on a kosher supermarket in Paris will be buried at the Givat Shoul Cemetery in Jerusalem. The bodies of the victims, Yohan Cohen, 22, Yoav Khatab, 21, Philippe Baram, 45, and François Michel Saada, 64, arrived early this morning at Ben Gurion Airport. They were killed last Friday when Amadi Koulibaly stormed the Hiper Kasher store and opened fire. This followed an attack earlier in the week on the head office of the Charlie Hebdo satirical magazine, which left 12 people dead. In the aftermath of three-day ordeal, an outpouring of support has come from all corners of the globe, embodied by the widespread adoption of the slogan, Je suis Charlie. On Sunday, a mass rally was held in Paris, attended by more than one million people and 40 world leaders. Joining me now in the studio are Coletta Vital, a former Israeli deputy ambassador to France. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Yossi Frankel, a volunteer uh, of Zaka. Uh, the, the funeral actually began. We're going to go to, to some live images uh, from the scene uh, at the moment. Um, live image, there we are, where uh, the funerals will begin shortly. Of course, we're going to receive live updates from uh, our volunteers. We see. Uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, we know President Reuven Rivlin, we also see the head of the opposition, Isaac Herzog, all attending uh, the funeral. <coughs> now, uh, before we begin with our guests in the studio, we'd like to have a short recap of this past week's horrific uh, terror attack in Paris. <laughs> The 
avait trois hommes euh, en armes qui ont investi les locaux de Charlie Hebdo, Kalachnikov, fusée à pompe. Et nous avons donc euh, engagé le plan Vigie Pirate Attentat. Il y a 12 personnes disparues, 8 blessés, dont 4 euh, en situation d'urgence absolue. Selon un témoin, les tireurs criaient « Allah Akbar » et affirmaient vouloir venger le prophète. Quel prophète Leur prophète, c'est Satan, malheureusement. Un policier, en toute occasion, saura s'interposer lorsqu'il faudra qu'il protège la nation. Actuellement, une opération est en cours. Un individu de type africain, euh, porteur d'une Kalachnikov, a été signalé présent là à hauteur du 23 avenue de la porte de Vincennes. Et d'après la gérante qui est à l'intérieur et de sources policières, euh, il y avait des morts. Dans le moment où nous sommes, nous devons tout faire pour assurer la protection de nos concitoyens. Il sera capable aussi de résister à toutes les épreuves. Getting killed and, and you cannot help but think of those people who went on a Friday innocently in a supermarket, not even fancying or dreaming that this would happen to them, or to their and their families couldn't realize it. And I think that the fact that there's so much public support, and, and you see both what has been happening in France to pay them tribute and in Israel. I think this must be a comfort to the family. Obviously, there's nothing that can really be a consolation to somebody who's lost her father or her husband or who's remained alone with children and doesn't know what to do next. But I think that the way to pay tribute to those people is something of great importance. And I really and truly do not wish to mix any politics in it, I think. We are doing the right thing by bringing them to funeral here. The French government has done the right thing. Um, let us just keep their memory alive. Definitely, it's uh, important to remember that it is a very emotional day and it shouldn't be made political. Um, however, you did spend time in France and you're familiar with the culture and with the people and you speak French. Did you ever imagine that the situation, especially for French Jews, could deteriorate this much. French Jews are, are running away. They're seeing Aliyah as a necessity. Yes, well, you know, I would prefer to see Aliyah not as a necessity, but an act of, of faith and Zionism, and not only running away from something. And I'm not sure that this is the right way to encourage them to run away. By the way, by encouraging people to run away, it's also, in a way, conceding to terrorism and telling the jihadis that they have won in this particular case. But I would like to say something, you know, when I was in France, I was there in the 80s, and that was during the Lebanon war. And there was hardly a day without an incident, without an act of terrorism. Many of those were uh, um, addressed or, or aimed, targeted at Israeli uh, diplomats and so on. I was there when some of my colleagues got killed. I, one of my colleagues at the embassy, I saw him on a Saturday morning when I went to pick up my mail and my newspapers. And five minutes later, he was assassinated. That was a very tough time. And, and there was also uh, um, an incident at, uh, at one of the restaurants, the Goldberg restaurant. So it's not that it's getting worse. It is the antisemitism has been growing, but it has been changing its face. And I think it is important for us to understand two things. 
First thing is that most of anti-Semitic acts today in Europe and elsewhere, 80% are carried not by the Catholic, French people, but by the Muslims. And this is a new phenomenon. And unfortunately, every time that there are incidents or wars in the Middle East, this becomes worse. And the second thing I think to remember is the fact that we're not the only targets in this particular case. Absolutely. What is being what targeted? Yeah, what is being targeted <clears throat> is Western civilization. And we are one of the targets. That again doesn't make it any better for us. But I think it is important to see the general context, to see that it is again targeted also against governments. That, that yeah, I'd like to talk more about yeah. the the nature, uh, whether it's anti-Semitic or really uh, an attack on people. But we have uh, we're going um, to uh, a phone call we have with Paris, uh, Jonathan uh, Jonathan Hefetz who is the Israeli emissary of the Jewish Agency, joining me now on the phone. Hi, Jonathan. Hello again. Hi, thanks for joining us. What's the latest? I know that uh, the, the last time you spoke with us, you said that the Jewish community is in, in entire shock. 